evening and welcome to BSA Space. My name is Gretchen Schneider. I'm an architect and the civic design director for the Boston Society of Architects. And I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening. We have a terrific crowd in front of us of architects, landscape architects, engineers, climate change scientists, activists, government officials, and concerned citizens. So I trust that tonight will be a lively conversation. Tonight's event, the City and the Sea, Boston's Evolving Dance with Water ties into several initiatives that are underway. This is part of the BSA's Designing Boston series, organized by the Boston Society of Architects. Designing Boston provides a forum to discuss current trends and concerns in architecture and urban planning that may shape Boston's future. Preparing for climate change is certainly high among those concerns. Tonight's event is also held in conjunction with Boston Living with Water an international call for design solutions, envisioning a more resilient, more sustainable, and more beautiful Boston, adapted for end of century climate conditions and rising sea levels. We're pleased to welcome Mike Ross as our moderator tonight. A familiar um, name and face to many of you, Mike's experience solving complex problems and bringing disparate parties together as a legislator now extends to his practice as an attorney at Prince Lobel Tie where he focuses on real estate, strategic advice, and government relations. Mike served for 14 years as a Boston City Councilor, as well as serving as the president of the body. In 2013, he entered the race for mayor, sharing a bold vision for the city's future. Mike holds a bachelor's degree from Clark University, an MBA from BU, and a law degree from Suffolk. Mike writes a regular column for the Boston Globe and was recently appointed by President Obama to serve on the Council of the United States Holocaust Museum. Mike, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gretchen. Thank you all of you. This is, really is a great turnout. And I, I love, Gretchen, how you started this off. You, it's so architect of you to have people move to the middle. <laughs> and take, and I've been to, you know, endless of these things. That's never been announced. It's only an architect could, could do that, so right. Uh, as Gretchen said, my name is Mike Ross. Uh, it's really great to be here uh, for this important and you know, perhaps even scary uh, conversation uh, about our city and its relationship to the sea, uh, specifically to sea level rise and the, co the consequences thereof. Uh, allow me to just begin uh, by way of a, a crude analogy. Uh, imagine that this cup of water represents the city's harbor. I'm not going to do anything crazy here, but... Um, <laughs> its walls, the maximum level in which the harbor can withstand sea level rise until it overflows onto our neighborhoods. For years, Boston has had a false sense of confidence that our harbor would protect us uh, from disasters like uh, storm surge and 100 year storms. Unlike the coasts of New York and New Jersey and other coasts throughout the world, which are wide open and exposed, Boston's coastline is protected by a labyrinth of land masses from Cape Cod to Cape Ann, from Quincy Hall and Winthrop to the 32 Harbor Islands that are in front of us. And while these intervening body of lands do in fact protect us from storm surges and massive waves. They offer no protection, none, for sea level rise, which is also brought about by global warming. So in some ways, this false sense of security only got us into greater trouble. Our forefathers and mothers built neighborhoods and buildings right up to the water's edge and right at the water's level. So now that we know about the dangers of sea level rise, has it changed where we site our buildings? Absolutely not. Today, the water's edges and their neighborhoods are more popular than ever. In fact, just last month, I bought a condominium <laughs> in East Boston, across the way from the harbor, in a flood zone having to pay extra for flood insurance. So we really haven't figured this thing out yet. <laughs> Certainly, I haven't. So what do we do? 
1988, a Boston-based architect that many of you know, Antonio DiMambro, raised some eyebrows at the time when he proposed a multi-billion dollar project that would construct a ribbon of mammoth sea gates that would surround the outer periphery of Boston Harbor, connected by the Harbor Islands to prevent a rising ocean from entering the region. Today, this sea belt concept is in fact the standard of care. The cities of Seattle, London, and St. Petersburg have similar seawall structures in place, and a proposed project uh, coming in in upwards of $23 billion looks like it is going to proceed in New York and New Jersey as they move forward with building a giant seawall. All this to say, ocean, you have our attention. <laughs> Today's panel is divided into three parts. One, how did we get here? Two, what is the worst that can happen to us? And three, what should we do about it? So how did we get here? The onomatopoeically named Nancy Seashores, <laughs> who is to Boston landscape what Orville Redenbacher is to popcorn, <laughs> is the historian and author of Gaining Ground, a history of landmaking in Boston. Nancy will lay out the conditions by which Boston's land and coast were formed. Julie Wormser is the executive director of the Boston Harbor Association, a nonprofit organization focused on economic development, public access, and sea level rise adaptation along Boston's waterfront. I am not the mayor of Boston, nor am I the governor of the Commonwealth. However, if I were, my first call on this subject to gain crucial knowledge uh, about it would be to Julie. Uh, she has a wealth of knowledge in this area. She'll tell us all the bad news we need to know that sea level rise will bring over these next several decades. And finally, Amy Corte is a partner of Arrow Street and the co-author of the recent Urban Land Institute report on the urban implications of living with water. Amy is gonna tell us what to do about it and if that is in fact in place. She's gonna talk about examples that are across the world and what Boston can do. And then there is you. There are many, many smart people in this room of all uh, stripes and uh, shapes and sizes. We have, for one thing, um, the outgoing secretary of the city of Boston, Brian Sweat, who did an amazing job as environmental secretary for many years and transformed a lot of the work that we need to do. Uh, and we have other city officials, but we also have, obviously, architects, but we have developers here, and we have other people who are in this business. This conversation only works if you participate in it. We participate in it. We've allowed a lot of time uh, for that participation. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first panelist who has a brief presentation. They're each gonna do a brief presentation, around 10 minutes, and then they're gonna sit down and we're gonna have some Q&A and we're gonna all get into it together. Uh, Nancy Seashells. Thanks, Mike. Well, I'm supposed to tell you how we got into this mess. So we're gonna start with this image that maybe a lot of you saw on the invitation for this event. That first one might have been hard to understand. Perhaps this will be a little easier. This, what's shown in green here, is the original land of Boston in 1630 when it was first established. All of this lighter green around it are areas that have been, uh, land that has been made by filling in tidal flats. As we can see from this detail from the 1795 map of Boston, these tidal flats were extensive. They're shown here with this stippling, and as you can see, they surround all the original landforms. This green line, by the way, snaking through the map, shows the boundaries of Boston in 1795. These tidal flats were pretty easy to fill. As you know, tidal flats are covered with water at high tide, exposed mud flats at low tide. So when Boston began to grow very rapidly at the end of the 18th century, all they did was just begin to fill in the tidal flats to create more land for the city that, which needed it. Finally, uh, the other areas did too, eventually arriving at the city that we know today. So you can see in the comparison of the two how much of this is made land. Well, how did they do it? 
Basically, the technique used to make land in Boston is really simple. They built a structure during most of the 19th century, it was a stone seawall, around the outer perimeter of an area to be filled, and then they just dumped in fill behind it until the level of fill was above the level of the high tide. It was that simple. And there are places today where you can still see um, the results of this and so see some of these seawalls. Um, this, oh, sorry, this is a drawing of a seawall that now exists behind Back Street in Back Bay. These seawalls were built of big stone uh, blocks, usually granite or sometimes rock spray pudding stone. The front was usually perpendicular, the back uh, generally sloped out what they called a battered profile, and then there were um, small stones backed up against this uh, for support called ballast. This seawall, forward now, uh, still exists, and you can see it. These two photos were taken 100 years apart. This is 1894, this is 1994. Um, we both taken from standing on the Harvard Bridge and looking at Back Street. Uh, what you can see here, uh, this building here, you can see right there, and this building is that one. I mean, just to show that the photos line up. So, in case you were not aware that the seawall next to Storrow Drive was once along the river's edge, this to just show you that it was, and in case you didn't know, Storrow Drive and the Esplanade are on made land. The part of the seawall right here next to the Harvard Bridge was built in the early 1880s, but most of this um, along Storrow Drive was built in the 1860s and 70s when Back Bay was being built. Here's another example of a seawall that you can still see. This one, of course, is in front of Christopher Columbus Park, uh, right, it's hard to see from this angle, but right there is what I'm trying to show you, between Commercial Wharf and Long Wharf, um, and it was built in the late 1860s and 70s when um, Atlantic Avenue was put across the waterfront. Well, so what do all these seawalls and all this filling have to do with sea level rise? Well, I think this map will help us understand. Uh, this is a map that is based on data collected by a team at UMass Boston and then developed by the Boston Harbor Association. The um, outline of the original shoreline of Boston was put on by a project in which I'm now working, which is to produce an historical atlas of Boston. The pink shows what would flood if there was um, a tide five feet above present mean high tide. The orange shows what would flood if there were a tide 7.5 feet above mean high tide. But you can see that there is a real um, congruence between original land and what doesn't flood, but most importantly, that so much of the made land is low-lying and would flood. In other words, it's all of this man-made land that has gotten us into trouble. Now, the panel said they wanted me to talk to, about an area that I know that was not filled above the high tide, so I'm going to talk about this area right here, the Tremont Street area of the South End. This is an 1852 map of Back Bay. What we're, you can see the original shoreline going along here, which duplicates the original shoreline shown on the map right there. This um, promontory was called Gravelly Point. You can see it on both maps. Uh, in between 1818 and 1821, a dam was built across the entire mouth of Back Bay from Charles Street at the foot of uh, the Common, all the way over to what's today Kenmore Square. This is today's Beacon Street, mm -hmm. and it was built with two of these seawalls that we've been talking about on either side. We can remember with uh, perpendicular uh, fronts, battered uh, backs, and then ballasted with small stones. They were set 50 feet apart, and as I said, this is Beacon Street on top of them. Mm -hmm. The point of the dam was to power tide mills. This is, you have to, to understand this, you have to remember that at this time the Charles River was a tidal estuary. This was long before the first Charles River Dam was built and certainly before the second Charles River Dam was built. So the Charles River was subject to the rise and fall of the tide. 
The way it worked, oh, there was a second dam, a cross dam, built intersecting the main dam on the line of today's Hemingway Street, which is really hard for me to see at this angle, but is right going along there. It would intersect the main dam um, today between Hereford Street and Mass Ave. The way it worked was that high tide water would be taken into the full basin created by the cross dam dividing Back Bay into two basins. Then it would flow through waste raceways on Gravelly Point, turning the wheels of mills that were located there, then flow out into what was called the receiving basin, and then at low tide, back into the river. But, in order to allow the mills to operate as long as possible, they kept the water in the receiving basin abnormally low. That is, it never got up to the high tide level. They kept it at about four feet above mean low tide. That meant that in the 1830s, when they began to fill around the edges of Back Bay, this area didn't have to be filled up, up to the level of high tide. At this time, um, all, these, uh, new, uh, all this new building was served by sewers. Sewers in this period all emptied at the nearest shoreline. Mm -hmm. So the sewers could empty, the land was um, not above the high tide, but the sewers could still empty because the receiving basin was kept so low. The problem was when they began to fill back the main part of Back Bay in the 1850s. Then they rerouted all the sewers out to the Charles River, which had a normal tidal flow. Well, that meant that by this time they also had flush toilets. That meant by that then the toilets couldn't flush at high tide. And often during storms, sewage would just back up into people's houses. Well, what to do about it? Some areas were even were particularly low, particularly what's today the Bay Village area, uh, Mass Pike housing, I'm, at, I'm sorry, Mass Pike Towers and Castle Park, uh, Castle Square housing. Those were so low that in the late 1860s and 70s, the city actually raised these mm -hmm. buildings. They jacked them up about 14 or 17 feet and put fill in underneath to raise them so that their sewers could operate. But they did not do that for the Tremont Street area of the South End. It was just a little bit higher, still below the level of high tide, but a little bit higher. They. Uh, the people in this area experienced serious flooding for many years until finally in 1915 they built a pumping station on Union Park Street to pump up the sewage so that it would flow. This pumping station has worked better or and not so well over the years as residents of that part of the South End know, but that's not our point right now. Our point is to remember that the reason that we are so vulnerable to sea level rise is because of all the man-made land, the low man-made land in Boston. And now I turn it over to Julie, who's going to tell us what's going to happen in the future. That was fascinating. So a lot of the work um, here is, is from our, our work preparing for the rising tide, which we published just after Hurricane Sandy, um, which maps Boston's vulnerability to future coastal flooding. Um, it also encourages property owners today, in today's and tomorrow's flood zone, sorry Mike, to know and decrease your risk. <laughs> Designing with Water just came out um, this summer, uh, similar to the ULI report. Uh, it really goes into what the Dutch are doing. They know uh, dikes and levees, um, but they're going beyond dikes and levees to also talk about beautiful, resilient design. And so um, we've got a couple of great reports out there to say, okay, so what do you do about all this water? Um, so go to tbha.org, uli.org, um, as well to pick these up. So Superstorm Sandy in um, October 29th, two years ago, uh, was the largest storm to ever hit the East Coast in, his, uh, in recorded history. Um, most hurricanes are 300 miles long. 
This was a thousand miles long and ran into a nor'easter, which made it veer uh, to the west and hit um, New York and New Jersey. Where it made landfall, it wreaked havoc with our transportation systems, cultural icons, electrical grid, and residential areas. But this is what Boston looked like uh, during Hurricane Sandy. This is the extent of our flooding. And the question is, why were we spared? And the answer is not just distance from the epicenter. So coastal flooding, um, as Mike went into, uh, is not just sea level. Um, it's storm surges. Um, in this part of the world, the storms come from the east. Think of a nor'easter. And that uh, wind pushes water in front of it uh, until it hits land. Also, when you've heard of low barometric pressure, it means that there's less air pushing down on water, so it allows it to uh, ride higher. Um, the scientific term wicked high tide, um, <laughs> which means when the, uh, it's an astronomical high tide is maybe a more boring term, but when the sun and the moon align during the full and new moons, we get an extra couple feet during the month. And then the underlying sea level rise. And I have my poor daughter. I keep mentioning my daughter. She's a scampy scamp. And um, when she was younger, she would have tremendous um, tantrums in the bathtub. And if we were flood prepared, <laughs> we would have only put a little bit of water in that bathtub. Um, or if she had been a calmer, less um, energetic child, she would have been, you know, could have had a full bathtub. But the combination of um, forgetful parents and energetic child meant we had a full bathtub and a full-blown um, storm and a lot of coastal flooding. So when you think about coastal flooding, it's really that interplay between storm and sea level, and it also means that as sea level rises, you need smaller and smaller storms or tantrums to flood. So um, here's Boston, here's New York. Um, I am a Boston partisan. One thing that is objectively better about Boston is our harbor. We're about 200 miles apart, but it's not just the distance that saved us during Sandy. As Mike was saying, to the north is um, Cape Ann, the south Cape Cod, and that, that bumpy part offshore is Stellwagen Bank. If you've ever gone whale watching, that's an a, uh, offshore reef, essentially, where there's a great whale food. Um, and it also, all of those different land masses decrease the energy of a storm coming into the harbor. And then again, as Mike was mentioning, um, Winthrop to the top, Hull to the, to the south, 34 Harbor Islands. And you can even see the Harbor Islands outside of the harbor, how skinny they are. They're really taking one for the team. Um, that shows the energy of an offshore storm. But by the time you get to downtown Boston, where that star is, a 30-foot offshore wave is a two-foot wave. So you know all of the manufactured um, coastal defenses that other cities are having to do uh, really are topography does a whole lot of good for us. Um, unlike New York, um, poor New York, remember that our storms are nor'easters, right? So you're going to get an easterly wind north of Long Island going down the East River and south of Lo and then up through New York Harbor, which itself is a narrow, almost island-free harbor, and there's nowhere for all that water to go but up. So um, when you look at the storm surge of Boston versus New York, um, Boston Harbor, our thousand-year storm, which if, of course isn't that you get one of these storms in a thousand year and then you're good to go, it's that theoretically it's a one in a thousand chance of having that storm in a given year. So our thousandth year, our thousand year storm is almost two feet lower than New York's hundred year storm because their harbor concentrates water while ours dissipates it. So here's what this looks like during Hurricane Sandy, and this is getting into the tidal aspect of coastal flooding. This is the Coast Guard station um, in, the, in lower Manhattan at the Battery, and this is what that looked like um, during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, huh. so, um, so that blue line, that undulating blue line, that is the, high, the predicted high tide based on where the sun and the moon are. 
The green line is the sandy storm surge. And then, of course, those are additives. So this is called the storm tide, which is the tide plus, um, plus the storm surge. And, he, and Sandy actually hit on a wicked high tide. So tide plus storm meant 14 feet of flooding above low tide. Um, hit uh, lower Manhattan to catastrophic result. This is where our tide gauge is in the Coast Guard Station right off the Northern Avenue Bridge near the Children's Museum, the Boston Harbor Hotel. This is what Sandy looked like to that tide gauge. Um, so our tide just happens to be um, a higher tide. We have a 10-foot tide instead of a 4-foot tide in Boston. Um, again, it was a wicked high tide that day. But you look at um, Sandy's storm surge, and for those reasons we mentioned topographically, it's much lower, not just because we were away from the epicenter, but also because of our topography. And it peaked five and a half hours um, after um, high tide. And so had that storm peaked at high tide, we would have had a 100-year flood event. What is um, less well known, though, is that is one of four times that has happened since January um, 2012. So um, let me see if I can remember them. Hurricane Saturn, Blizzard Nemo, um, Her Hercules, Nor'easter, I'm sorry, it wasn't Hercules. Nor'easter Hercules, Nor'eastern Saturn, Nemo and um, Sandy all missed a 100-year flood event or a high tide plus five feet flood event by a half a high t uh, tide cycle. So it is to say, like that rising water in the bathtub, these 100-year storms are really, we should stop calling them that. It's really just, um, we we're, we're, are closer and closer to a a major flood event. So the last piece of the equation is sea level rise. This is a map, or this is a chart I'm sure many people have seen from the US National Climate Assessment. These are not radical folks. Um, and basically, the, these curves change uh, based on two things. One is the scientific uncertainty, and the other one is the uncertainty in human behavior. So the lowest means if we stopped emitting carbon today, that's how much sea level rise is locked into the system. And the highest curve is um, the highest probable sea level over a course of time. So for planning purposes, we used a range of likely to possible um, estimated sea level, um, which means one to two feet of sea level rise in 2050. We're almost certain to get a foot. We could get as much as two feet. And then by the turn of the century, three to six feet of increase. And unfortunately, as the data get better and the models get better, these estimates keep going up, not down. So this is what um, Hurricane Sandy looked like to Boston that day. Just a little bit of flooding around the edges. Um, so this yellow is zero to two feet of flooding. That's right around the aquarium. Um, so this was not a big deal. What's more of a big deal is we saw this amount of flooding 21 times between 1920 and 1990. Um, since January 2012, we've seen this amount of flooding 15 times. So, and then the question of, of those four storms, if those storms had peaked at high tide, we would have seen this amount of flooding. So this was Nancy's uh, magenta. Um, color, which is basically, this is how much flooding you get at high tide, um, or officially mean higher high tide anyway, but it's, it's average high tide plus five feet of water. And that is the innovation district um, where we're sitting. Um, that, unfortunately, um, Atlantic Wharf does seem to flood at that point as well. But um, so that is uh, today's 100-year flood, is what they call that, um, is the estimate by FEMA. Um, this is about 7% of Boston. So you can also think of 7% of Boston is within five feet of high tide. Um, this is what's considered the current flood zone, 100-year flood zone. But with two feet of sea level rise, that's the annual flood by mid-century. And it's the twice daily high tide by the turn of the century. And that's a very different city. That's a lot of salt water to deal with. 
And if you've been following the FEMA maps, the old FEMA maps showed very little of this flooding because they were using more rainfall data um, than storm, coastal storm data. This is the, these are the draft FEMA maps. Um, they're not quite right, but they're a lot closer. They use very different um, uh, methods to get their maps, but they, they pretty well align with what we came up with, with the, what our scientists came up with. So what floods at this uh, level of water? Um, the innovation district, I've been, uh, in my mind keep calling it the inundation district because it is so <laughs> flat and there's billions of there are billions of dollars of, of new buildings going up right now. Um, this is a Bayside Expo that UMass Boston just purchased for dorms. Um, if you use a Gillette razor, it was made here at Gillette uh, World Shaving Headquarters in Fort Point Channel. Uh, Charlestown Navy Yard, and if you remember the etching between um, in the granite between um, Faneuil Hall and City Hall, that was the original shoreline, and and high tide plus five peak goes back to that shoreline. So this super scary map is uh, not likely to happen today, but it um, it is something that is this is high tide plus seven and a half feet. Another way you can think about it is just. Um, as you saw in Nancy's map, this is really the amount of the city that floods at that level, right? Um, so today, this is a near impossibility. This is about a third of Boston. If we have two feet of sea level rise, or when we have two <coughs> feet of sea level rise, that becomes our 100-year storm or flood. If we have six feet of sea level rise by the year uh, two. Uh, 2100, that is an annual storm, or it actually even <laughs> happens during the wicked high tide. So that's, you know, and of course, we must act before this happens. A, a city cannot be flooded with this much salt water this often and still uh, remain a, a robust, vibrant city. So what floods at this level? That's where our commerce really gets affected. Logan Airport is six feet above, sea, above high tide. Um, Conley Cargo Terminal in, in South Boston, uh, the, the downtown wharves, uh, this is East Boston, Mike, sorry, <laughs> and, uh, th and this is uh, South Boston. And again, you know, this is very similar to our, this is a 1775 map, and, and so, you know, one day Boston will return to its original uh, form. Not today, not in our lifetimes, but at some point. And so the question really is, what do we do between today um, and this future? So let's pass on to Amy. design for water for our cities? How do we design for water for our buildings? Um, and really the answer is there's no single solution. And there's definitely no single solution that we can point to that will hold for the next 20 years, that will hold for the next 10 years, that will hold for the next 50 years. And I think this quote is great because basically as soon as you come up with an idea, a design, a solution for solving how you might address sea level rise, you're going to need to adapt it, and you're going to need to change it, and you're going to need to basically reinvent it as the sea levels continue to rise and as technology continues to improve. So I've gathered a couple of images um, from around the world, um, and then ending in Boston. Some illustrate kind of more visionary, <coughs> conceptual proposals. Some illustrate um, more practical ones that are currently being proposed in New York and elsewhere. We'll start in Rotterdam. Um, Rotterdam has been dealing with sea level rise for the last thousand years, and over the last hundred years, with climate change, they're really starting to battle um, kind of extreme rainstorms and heavy precipitation. I'm starting with this because they're dealing with how do you make room for water um, in an area that, unlike Amsterdam, there is no canal system that they can drain the water into. So Rotterdam is looking at kind of these leftover urban spaces, urban plazas that need an upgrade anyways. Um, so this first example is called a water plaza, water square. Um, it deals mostly with fresh water, but there's, just like the city of Cambridge is kind of dealing with these heavy rainstorms, how do you kind of hold the water before you, know, you discharge it back into the sewer and the, um, the wetlands? What do you do with it? 
during that brief moment when the rainstorm happens. So this is a rendering of it. Um, it's recently constructed. This is um, how it would look in a rainstorm. Um, and the idea is there's a series of public um, spaces, um, sunken plazas, that basically collect water from the green roofs and then begin to collect them in these smaller spaces. And when it's not raining, those areas are available for sports fields, for play, for um, grandstands, type of thing. This is it being built. You can see this is the biggest um, plaza down in the center. It becomes a basketball field when it's not um, flooded. And then smaller areas that this is a skate bowl that can be used. Um, gritty, not completely pretty, but it works. Um, designed for fresh water, it's controlled as it comes in. Um, this image in the upper right, um, you can see the gutter coming out and basically the water flows in through the system of stainless steel gutters that basically line the edges of the park. Moving on to, <laughs> I didn't want to include this and talk about gondolas again, Mike made me. Um, <laughs> but similar to how do you make room for water and building off of you know, Nancy's um, fill in the back bay, um, this was generated as part of our ULI um, Living with Water report um, done by Mike Wang and Erlen Stalwitz. Um, and it really reconceived, how do you imagine if the back bay let water in, and flooded the alleyways, um, what would that look like? How would our vision of the city change? It was basically designed to provoke a conversation, and it definitely did. Um, it's been estimated that basically this report's been downloaded and um, has been passed around the globe. About three million people have seen it, which is pretty impressive. Um, it went to London. I think it got translated into Spanish. Dennis did an interview on that. Um, and then I think the biggest question we got asked during all the interviews was how do you how do you begin to rebuild and reconstruct the existing building stock? How do you adapt that for um, sea level rise, for higher groundwater? Um, the New York Department of Planning issued this report this past October. It's a really great resource. Goes into, um, basically looks at all of the building stock that is within the new FEMA map, um, the 2013 FEMA maps that are coming out. There's about 400,000 um, residents that live in about 72,000 buildings that are affected by the new FEMA maps and the 100-year floodplain, and it itemizes all the buildings by building typology. So you've got single-family residence, you've got single-family homes, multifamily walk-ups with elevators, without elevators, and what's really interesting is that they propose, what's highlighted in yellow over here, if it gets to work, um, is they propose basically giving up the basement. You fill in the basement, you reinforce the foundations, you allow that reinforcement to potentially gain you an extra floor on top of your building, and the mechanical equipment, which is this darker yellow back here, begins to get elevated above that new 100-year flood storm. And then the ground floor, no residential units are proposed anymore. That basically becomes either the basement uses move up, like the laundry facility, or community spaces occupy those buildings. I included this one because over the course of the last year, we've gotten asked by many of our clients, you know, how can we use underground garages as water storage? Um, and what they faced in New York with the flooding and the storm surge that occurred there was contaminated water coming into the garages that took a lot of effort to bounce back and to recover from. This again is an example of fresh water. Um, it's a car park in Rotterdam. The cars and the water are separated. You can kind of see it in this rendering down here where there are a series of um, kind of holding tanks that accommodate up to 10 million liters of water. Um, and within 30 minutes of the sewage system beginning to overflow, rainwater can flow into here where it's held until that system is able to recover. The image on the right is an image looking kind of through those holding cells when it's empty. Um, floating buildings. <laughs> This was our proposal for um, the Wharf 8 Pier 7 RFP that went out. It's an idea for a floating barge that went between the Bank of America Pavilion and Liberty Wharf. Um, the idea that you could begin to reimagine how you might construct buildings, how they might be supported, how they might um, you know, adjust with the sea level rise. A nighttime rendering of it um, was accompanied by a marina. And there's a series of um, firms um, in Rotterdam and abroad that are also dealing with this. Water Studio has a whole series of proposals out. This is the first, what's been built as the first multifamily residential um, building 
that was supposed to have started construction this year. Um, it's designed, it's ba basically being constructed in a dry dock, and then it'll flood up to six feet, and it's part of their reclaiming of the polders in the, in the Netherlands, and so it's ultimately designed to accommodate 12 feet of depth for the water. And then this last category um, called fortifying edges. How do we begin to reimagine how we might protect our cities at that regional level by building up the edges, increasing the heights of the seawalls? This is an example from Spain. Um, really beautiful um, kind of harbor, harbor walk, beach promenade that built up the, um, the edge of the city. Um, oops and then allowed for a series of program and recreational spaces to reconnect the, the residents down to the beach. Um, the Rising Com Tides competition out of San Francisco in 2009 also had some really great examples, um, which are definitely relevant for the Living with Water competition. Um, this was one of a, um, a levee that would also become an estuary. And then this one, which didn't necessarily look at fortifying the edges, but basically looked at redefining what that edge could be. And so this was the edge, again, historic edge of San Francisco Bay. Um, this is the current edge. So similar to Boston, San Francisco is facing, you know, what do you do with these inland um, or infilled lands? And then this is the proposal for the new edge. And beginning to think about how do we reimagine where that ground plane is? How do we raise the ground plane up? How do we begin to float buildings as their nomad solution um, shared in the lower right? And then the last one, this is from um, our design charrette for ULI um, for the Innovation District. This image illustrates the 100-year flood um, based on the new preliminary 2013 FEMA maps. Um, that should be adopted next year. And what was great about the charrette that we had in May was it brought together a wide variety of stakeholders. We had developers, we had insurance experts, we had contractors, um, we had architects, and we had city officials that all looked at the innovation district about six hours during the course of one day, brainstormed ideas, and had a discussion around how would you reimagine what South Boston could look like if we accepted that um, you know, daily, twice daily high tides would become part of the, what was to be expected. Um, and this quote was from one of the contractor developers on our team, basically, you know, you know you're crazy. If I'm going to develop a building here and I know it's going to flood twice a day, why would I do it? And yet we're developing, we're filling in, and, and for us as design professionals, how are we, um, how are we designing our buildings so that they can accommodate um, twice daily high tides in 50 years and 20 years and what are we doing about it um, this turned out to be our proposal we looked at it from um, kind of the more district scale reimagining what um, what the harbor walk could be um, if you raised up the seawall by three feet knowing that it wasn't going to be completely enough um, but then what development opportunities could you provide um, what types of program could you do along the edge? And this imagined a series of um, kind of hard infrastructure and green infrastructure. Um, and we also talked about how do you um, how do you pay for this? Um, how do you perhaps turn the mitigation payments that developers are currently paying um, and put them into more of a resiliency fund that would fund um, portions of this reimagined harbor walk? This was a perspective. Um, the potential edge condition. And we also looked at the phased adaptation. How do we begin to um, implement this over time, over the next 20 years, which this illustrates phase one, and it's basically rebuilding a portion of the harbor walk, raising up some of the sidewalks, um, starting to look at the critical infrastructure that is currently in the basement or on the ground floor. Phase two, over the next 20 to 50 years, um, beginning to move that critical infrastructure up to the upper floors, the second floor of the roof. Um, and then also in South Boston, because we're dealing with the FAA height restrictions, could we begin to build in extra height within to that ground level floor so that over the course of time, if you need to raise up the sidewalks, that you could begin to raise up that ground floor elevation to buy yourself an extra one or two feet. Um, and so trying to look at this both from the building scale, knowing that most of these buildings will be constructed by them, and also the district scale. And then the last uh, phase, 100 years from now, um, what happens? <laughs> so, 
I think the biggest uh, biggest struggle we faced was down there. Um, you know, a lot of our clients, a lot of the developers, they feel like they're prepared for Sandy. They're not sea level rise isn't on their radar. It's how do you how do you make this real for the developers? How do you make it real for our clients? Um, and how do we begin to um, build this into the buildings now? And I'll end on the Boston Harbor barrier. Oh, this mm. proposal that Mike mentioned, um, I think it's a great one. And if this, again, is the standard of care for how we might address our regional protection, you know, what is the, what is the standard of care that we need to do as design professionals? I mean, we know that the building codes are changing. We know that the FEMA maps kind of estimate a much more, um, much lower elevation than what the 100 year flood really should be. And with everything in flux, as it has been in the last year, um, with the regulations changing, with codes changing, I think it's really on us to start to define how we might address this. Uh, you know, I, I suddenly found myself wanting to find someone from the Netherlands and cling yeah, to right. them for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite an uh, eye-opener. I guess I'll, let me start with you, uh, Amy, if I could. Um, you know, I ask you, how, how is this uh, hitting the ground? Um, what are people saying about this? And what are developers saying? Do they even want to know about this? Uh, I mean, I think what we just saw is, fair to say, a grim picture of uh, the future for, um, for development, too, though. Um, how interested are developers, are your clients, in knowing this as they get into building buildings? Um, it, I think it really depends on who the client, who the landowner <coughs> is. If you're a long-term landowner um, who is going to be invested in the property over the course of the next 20 to 50 years, they are they are interested in it and they are dealing with it and they're raising raising the infrastructure where they can. They're building higher um, ground floor elevations. Um, it's when you have the shorter-term clients, the commercial clients, the costs of developing in South Boston especially are already so high. How do how do you, you know, even raise the critical infrastructure so it's on the second floor and not compromise the pro forma of the building? I mean, that's what we're we're dealing with. Because as soon as you put that infrastructure up, you lose rentable space, you lose residential units, you lose you know, other stuff. All right, and Julie, uh, how's Boston doing? And, and is have we just is there a reason for us to uh, only kind of get the memo quite recently on some of this? Yeah. Or, you know, as you all referenced in your presentations, other people have been working on this for, for decades. Uh, is, it, is there some uh, geographical reason why it's been okay for us to wait a little bit? And could you also tell us some of the things that we're doing in Boston? I think the uh, competition that you're working on is really excited, exciting. Um, that you should tell us about that, those three sites that you've identified, that a group has identified to um, to form a competition, right? Is that the Boston Harbor uh, group, or is that? It, it is. Yeah. I may not remember your whole question. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, I first want to say um, I'm a refugee from Congress. I had mostly done federal policy until Congress stopped uh, functioning well. So um, I have never experienced public policy move so quickly as I have since uh, Sandy in Boston. So I, I do want to congratulate the city of Boston for just uh, l incredible leadership and as well as the Bar Foundation uh, for really supporting that work. Um, so I think that's very good news. Why we've come so late to the game is I think there was a calculated decision by pro-environmental uh, policy advocates and, and policy makers to really focus on trying to prevent climate change. And this idea is if we started to talk about adaptation too quickly, we'd be giving up trying to prevent it. And it was only with the giant storms, giant wildfires, giant droughts that we said, we can't prevent this. We have to do both. And that's that's the goal is, um, you know, it's easier to think about keeping water out of your basement than to, you know, uh, insulate your house. But we have to do both, right, um, in terms of some of the best prevention is, preparedness is, is prevention, though we can't fully prevent this. So um, City of Boston, it, there's a draft climate action plan out right now, uh, really focused on preparedness. I think the comment period's another couple days. That should come out in uh, January. We are thrilled that the City of Boston is partnering with us and the uh, Boston Society of Architects on an international design competition. Um, 
to both uh, educate ourselves about climate resilient design, but also bring in the best ideas from all over the world. Because flooding is not like Martians attacking, right? I mean, people know flooding. We just don't flood as much as they have had in, in parts of the world where there are monsoons or, or you know, giant ri river deltas. This is new for us, but not for others. So we are bringing in good ideas from elsewhere. Um, there are three sites. Uh, the old Prince Spaghetti factory in the North End. It's now uh, a condominium. Um, and I'm forgetting what the, I'm forgetting what the sites are compared to the charrette. Um, the hundred acre uh, neighborhood in, in Fort Point Channel. It's essentially Gillette's uh, front yard and Morsi Boulevard. Thanks, Gretchen. I'm like, ah, oh, we had other sites for the charrette. <laughs> so, um, so it's the opportunity to redesign a building, a neighborhood, and a piece of infrastructure. And the great thing is with um, Department of Conservation and Recreation actually looking to redevelop Morsi Boulevard and the BRA having a master plan for a 100-acre neighborhood, there's a real opportunity to incorporate the winning ideas into an RFP. So that's quite exciting. So this may actually happen. Some, someone might create or design something that protects those three areas that you're working on. Our, our goal was to choose sites that really could be that both are at risk and could be redeveloped. Yeah. Okay. Um, Nancy, the uh, I think one of the most uh, effective thing in this presentation was uh, the map that shows us going right back to where we started. It's it's so depressing. Um, <laughs> what, you know, what would what would you do? What, if, I know Amy said you can't just do one thing, but if I had to make you choose just one thing. Where would you start here in Boston uh, to protect us from that eventuality? I thought I was supposed. To, I thought I was supposed to be talking about the past. Not the <laughs> we, we value your perspective on the past, and so I'm, I'm curious what you must have thought about this. You, you must have thought about, you know, how do we wind up exactly where we were, or, or, or even if you want to talk about something else. I mean, one of the things that I. <laughs> Boy, I can buy a, a, a buy your way out of this one. Um, you know the, the canals that we saw in Amy's presentation, or these little areas. You know, I, I don't understand how a small park could somehow solve this, right? I mean, it's like you can only fit so much water in one of those small parks. But what do you think about those canals and the gondolas and what's happening and what they're proposing in the back bay? I think that actually a lot of these proposals need to take uh, need to be um, have more research done on exactly what is going to be practical. Uh, the map I showed, if you remember it, had a lot of anomalies in it. There was a, it showed that original land. If you, uh, well, I don't have the map anymore. Oh, okay. Well, we're way down here. There. Okay. Here, I've got my laser pointer, too. <laughs> okay, no, can we go back to the map? Okay, that would be great. It was, a, it was at the very end, this one, there, okay. So it showed these parts of original land would flood just as much as the made land. And um, there were a lot of other things that I thought were sort of, uh, I know that a lot of Cambridge Port is low, but I don't think that just this one little part of East Cambridge is that much higher than the rest. The, these data apparently came from satellites, and I think we need to refine this. So that if we are going to be talking about canals, and I think that canal was down uh, Com Ave, um, if I understood the drawing correctly. I think we need to, to uh, refine the data and be a lot more careful about where we're planning some of these solutions. Um, we can't just take um, a gross assessment like this. That answers your question, or it gets me off the hook. Good job. For Good job. A different <laughs> Good job. All right, one question for any one of you, and then we're gonna open up to the, to the community here. Um, how do you pay for this? I mean, is there money out there? Is someone, is the federal government coughing up billions of dollars? And how is New York going to come out with $24 billion? Or do they have no choice and they have to? How are we paying for this? I think there's, there's two good questions there. I mean, New York is its own supernova, right? You know, there's, there's more money in New York um, that they may be able to pull that off themselves. Boston, it would be harder. I mean, one of the things that is... Uh, is really stressful about trying to deal with something that is 
this much of a public need and a public good is the fact that we have defederalized right now, right? That are, you know, when we cleaned up Boston Harbor and worked on the Big Dig, that had major public funding from elsewhere also, especially for the Big Dig. Um, we're not looking at a, a, a generous public, uh, federal government right now in terms of saying, sure, let's give a lot of money for resilience. Um, I think where that money, so you then say, okay, if we're not gonna get big public grants, or maybe we will, but it won't be enough, if it won't be enough, what's the market mechanism? And some very smart folks in Connecticut, and they know insurance in Connecticut, <laughs> right? Um, they are looking at, so how do you monetize future savings from avoided disasters into preparing today? So if you had a green bank, and it's actually quite similar to how you um, can have somebody pay for your solar panels and you pay them back by they're getting your energy savings from using those solar, solar panels, same idea. You have a green bank that loans you the money up front um, to prepare your house or you prepare your building or prepare your infrastructure and then that bank gets some of your avoided flood insurance premiums. And are they taking that to the next step? like social bond financing where governments that don't have to pay for something that otherwise they would have had to pay for is that are they there yet or no uh, don't know I mean but I think I think the future mechanism or so the market-based mechanism is going to be like that so if you are a better driver your insurance is less if you are a better better protected building your insurance is left less and then so the question is how do you pay for it if you don't have the upfront up capital and is there any money out there today right now well, HUD right now has a billion dollars for resilient cities, um, okay. which is good. And HUD spent a billion dollars on New York, which is good. Um, but uh, it's not what it needs to be. You know, in terms of the federal highway system amounts of money, it's not, it's not there. The commitment's not there right now. And is Boston a resilient city that's eligible for that billion dollars? Yes. Okay. Massachusetts. It's, it's by state. Massachusetts by state. is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so that's just kind of... Uh, uh, seasoning the, the water here. We're going to uh, get into it. I see a hand over here. And do we, we're, we're doing microphones or no? You want to just speak loud? I'll, I'll speak loud. Oh, that's good. Uh, I'm John Duff from UMass Boston. Uh, I've seen this map a number of variations. Of this right. <laughs> and I work right on Morrissey Boulevard, so I'm familiar with working high tides and what happens at Morrissey Boulevard. But I wonder whether or not anyone has an equivalent map or visualization of what happens to function. This is space, but there are certain things that are gonna go offline that aren't depicted here. Mm -hmm. um, right. And I'm wondering what things go offline first when you get to a flood of five feet or seven feet. That's a great question. And um, the, I would say, well, the short answer is I'm not sure. The, the folks who would know that would be like uh, <laughs> emergency response, you know, folks. Because right, you know, in a sense, this is very slow natural disaster. Right? And the folks who are who know what happens when we have giant blizzards would know what goes offline. Um, our third report, hopefully, is going to be a citywide uh, urban disaster resilience scorecard done with uh, AECOM and um, PricewaterhouseCooper and, and uh, IBM. They did that scorecard for uh, the UN. They are hoping to bring that resource to Boston. But we actually do need to not just look at what happens to the tunnel, what happens to the roads, what happens to the T, but how can you have a cascading failure of systems? So in New York, they, I mean, and we've learned a lot from New York, right? So in New York, they, their electrical grid went down, so they couldn't pump gas, and you, and you couldn't recharge your cell phone. So you have cascading system failures. And so one of the next steps, like, okay, great, we have, as Nancy was saying, sort of this first, uh, first look at what's at risk, and then you say, no, but really, where are the electrical transformers? Where are the gas tanks, et cetera? And, and again, amazing amounts has happened in two years, but we're really two years into this deep dive. Yeah, over here. Hi, I'm, I'm Thaddeus Pulaski. I'm a refugee from New York. I'm here Aww. right here. Uh, New York City Department of City, City Planning. Uh, we did that report that you showed, so thanks for showing that. Um, that was a companion to the set of regulatory reforms we did after Sandy, addressing our zoning, but also addressing our building code. I think that, that was some of the really important adaptation we did in the wake of Sandy that we'd actually started 
long before Sandy uh, with uh, with basically the design community in, in New York. And I'm wondering what's what's on the table now in Boston in terms of regulatory reform, uh, in both the building code, which I guess is state building code here, but also um, the you know the discretionary approval for new projects. I think this is. We realized in New York is that we don't have a government that's going to build seawalls necessarily in the absence of a major disaster. We have a government. We, most of the responsibility for adaptation is going to be on individual property owners. Um, it seems that way unless something really dramatic happens in our political system. So, so we realize that we have to find ways to, first of all, teach people about what, how, what they can do to make their own property more resilient, but then also find ways to fund that. And, well, so carrots and sticks is what I'm wondering. It just so happens we have the person who has been presiding over those policies and creating them here in this room, Brian Sweat, the city of Boston's uh, cabinet secretary. Uh, on the subject, Brian, would you mind, I hate to be on the spot, but would you mind maybe giving us a little <laughs> dissertation on that? <laughs> and feel free to come up here if you'd like. Oh, so I can, well, I won't make a turn. This is going to prevent me from being able to sneak out. <laughs> you need to go after that. <laughs> um, but it was a good teed up question. Uh, so one of our initial responses, so you're correct that uh, in, in Massachusetts, this, the building code is entirely state level. Uh, and actually city uh, officials don't even have appointees to the state board overseeing the state building code. Um, so we have been advocating for a while uh, to evaluate the state code. You know, right now, one of the challenges is in Boston uh, and in every city and town in Massachusetts, right now the state building code points to the FEMA maps for floodproofing standards. And as you know, was eloquently described here, that is backwards looking, right? That's for next year's insurance rate. It has no increase in precipitation, no increase in sea level rise, no increase in storm events. So it makes no sense from a design perspective to point to the FEMA maps for our design standards for a building code perspective. So we need to address that holistically. Um, we, in the zoning perspective, which we do have local control over, uh, we passed a year ago in October of 2013, uh, a, a climate preparedness checklist and questionnaire uh, that addresses all of the issues uh, associated with climate change. So we're focused on sea level rise here today. I'm equally concerned for the city of Boston from a heat island perspective. Uh, when we start to feel a lot more like Maryland and then a lot more like North Carolina, are buildings able to adapt to that? Uh, so this is a required part of the design review within the Article 80 review process for any building over 25,000 square feet in Boston. Uh, begins that conversation about how buildings are being prepared. And the first question it asks is, what's the expected life, uh, life scale of your building? Which is, the, which is the question we should be asking for how prepared you are. So if you're building a million square foot building on the waterfront, like Atlantic Wharf, uh, you, know, you expect to be around in 2070, 2080. If you're building a temporary building like where Louis is today in, uh, in Fan Pier, that's only supposed to be around for 30 years. It doesn't need to be planned for you know, the end of 2070. And so we need to start adapting our codes and our zoning to be flexible to the design expectations of the buildings we're building. So we're starting there. We're also looking at our flood proofing zoning, which is Article 25. Um, as well as uh, a local wetlands ordinance to address this. Access to the water is one of the challenges as the water continues to rise. Uh, so a, a myriad of things that will be uh, ongoing that have been going on in the last two years and will continue to go on. We're gonna, need to, we're gonna continue to need forums like this to keep the pressure on and to keep the ideas flowing and learning from places like New York. Well, what's, your, what's the one thing on your way out that you would wanna change that hasn't gotten traction yet? A building code is one, two, and three, right? So we need a full-scale assessment, and I'm not going to be prescriptive in terms of where it winds up, but we need to have a, a, a robust conversation the way New York did to say, does our building code allow us and require us to develop cities and buildings the way we should be? And if the answer is no, then we need to reform that building code and do so quickly because we're experiencing a building boom uh, in Boston like we have not seen before. Uh, and if we don't catch up to that, we're going to have a lot of buildings being built that we're saying, oh, I wish we had done this. And as we know, as folks in the room know, retrofitting is a whole lot more expensive than getting it right from the start. And what's the major hurdle between getting that done right now? I, th I think the challenge is the governance structures are not set up to address that. So the building code in the state of Massachusetts resides in the public safety cabinet and was originally driven by issues around you know, fire control and issues uh, with that in the building code. There is not yet a concerted effort uh, to reform the building code for these types of efforts, uh, for, for these types of challenges. So I think the first step, which is something that um, the city and the state are working on, is bringing together a consensus around design expectations for climate change. So what do we anticipate? So is, it, is 2050, is two feet a reasonable expectation for 2050? And then developing standards around that. Is six feet a reasonable expectation for 2100? And making sure that we're not overly burdening, because 
Um, I don't pretend to have the solutions. You know, the solutions may be flexibility uh, of design going forward. So it may not be something you build at day one, but you've thought about it so that you can retrofit your building cheaply in 2050. It may be operational changes. Uh, Atlantic Wharf, the building we're in today, is the only building that, um, there's the first building so far to get permitted a product called Aquafence, which they can install in a matter of hours and buy six feet of uh, storm protection from grade around this building and deploy in a matter of hours. And they went through a public improvement commission process because it's on a public sidewalk. They tested it two weeks ago or three weeks ago on a Sunday, or the bitterly cold Sunday that we actually got some snow. Perfect time to test it because we're more likely to have a nor'easter type event as a flooding event in Boston. And we're able to deploy it, understand how it works, and that bought them six feet of sea level rise, or six feet of storm surge above the grade um, to say, is the building protected? So it's solutions like that, it's design flexibility, it's operating changes, uh, and it's things we want to do at the get-go. Putting our infrastructure up above grade probably makes sense. The only reason that it is traditionally at grade or below grade is ease of access for maintenance, right? It costs a little bit more to get up on the roof, but if you want to see a climate-prepared building in true form in Boston, go to Spalding Rehab. Look at all the things that they have done. They are ready for the next 70 years plus uh, to be open and operating in the storm, and it costs them less than 1% additional hard cost over what there was then otherwise, because it was designed smart from the get-go. All right, Aquafence. Good. Good. <laughs> In the back. Hi, I'm Mike Davis. I'm a local architect who works in the inundation district. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like to push back against the question of how do we pay for all this? Because the conversation often runs aground when you say, well, how are we going to pay for this? But we don't know what this is yet. And it's not going to cost us billions and billions of dollars to actually commission some of these really smart people and go out and do a design proposal. I mean, that's short money. Then we'll know what we, can, what we, what we need to pay for and we can put, so we need a client. We need either somebody at the state level or some consortium of municipal governments to step up and say, you know, we are gonna actually retain somebody to come up with that thing, that this, that we can all start to raise money for and allocate funding for over the next, you know, 20 years. The big dig didn't happen, you know, in a design competition, you know, it took a client and it took real consultants to get the work done, so. Okay, all right, well, panel, uh, is this happening? Uh, is there uh, an effort underway? Are there consultants on it? Are they working on it? Amy, Nancy? Julie? <laughs> 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 I mean, so who the who would be, right? Depends on what it is. So is it infrastructure? Is it, um, I mean, I, the short answer is no. You know, that, that, I mean, if you're talking about something, the scale of the federal highway system, if you're talking about really, not just for Boston, but U.S. coastlines or U.S. riparian areas along our rivers, no, we're not mobilized to that level. Even in Boston, and Boston is really one of the most climate forward thinking uh, cities uh, in the country. Um, I feel like there's a lot, there's incredible thinkers in Boston who all know how to create beautiful structures, but we don't have a master plan, right? You know, so Boston doesn't know where it's gonna let flood, where it's gonna build up. And I think, you know, what Mike is, is saying is we do need whether, you know, what those big landowners, whether it's the city, the state, you know, commercial real estate, uh, universities, et cetera, we need to have some kind of master plan to say, what are we going to fortify? What are we going to make more resilient? And we don't, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay. I, think, I mean, it also gets back to okay. um, not just making building code changes, but are there zoning changes that we need to implement for different districts around the city, you know, based on what has been filled correctly, what isn't filled correctly, what areas are most prone to flooding, and how do we begin to identify those specifics um, within each district, um, within each area of Boston, and then start to provide regulations for it. I mean, the previous um, man from New York uh, mentioned, you know, what is the carrot versus the stick? And, you know, I hate to say it, but sometimes the stick is also lawsuits. I mean, the, in May of this year, um, farmers insurance companies sued the city of um, different Chicago municipalities because they had commissioned a storm surge report that identified that their storm um, system was not prepared to handle heavy precipitation. So the next time a heavy rainstorm hit, um, you know, the insurance company had a lot of you know, money that they had to pay back for all the residents, for all the owners that were affected by their property. And so they ended up suing, suing the municipalities. And does it take the next um, disaster or the next um, you know, big thing to happen before 
a broader master plan or for a broader vision for, for Boston can be implemented. Yeah, the liability, just sitting here thinking about the liability is immense. Uh, you had a comment in the front. Yes, um, my name is Ron Suffers. Um, in New, New Orleans, I also... I my character. Yeah. Hey. We can't hear you in the back. Thank you. Uh, New Orleans and much of the Netherlands are below sea level, you know, naturally. And they've addressed this by <coughs> dikes and levees, you know, over time. And I think for the most part, except for Katrina, you know, it's worked. Uh, are they addressing the, the five to seven foot rise in sea level by building these structures, this infrastructure, even higher? And are they not addressing things on a permanent basis by having, uh, you know, such levees or, or dikes? So New Orleans, when they rebuilt the levees, actually designed it for the one in 10,000 year flood. Um, I don't know if you guys know Wendy Goldsmith, who is from the bioengineering group. Um, she has a really great presentation about rebuilding the levees and basically designing so you're not looking at the past anymore. You're not designing for the previous flood conditions, the early FEMA maps, um, and then really projecting forward for that, um, the complex curve of sea level rise. Um, in, in, in a case like yeah. that, they don't have to retrofit buildings. They, they just, the city is surrounded by a, 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 an aqua fence. Okay, yeah. and, and nonetheless, both the Dutch and New Orleans are going to this resilience. It's not, it's not the right strategy anymore to, leave, to keep every drop of water out mm -hmm. and have all your eggs in one defense basket and say, okay, let's try to keep that water out. If it comes yeah. in, then what? Right, how can, you know, and there's different strategies whether you know, some strategies are like fail quickly, fail cheaply. You know, have your have your first floor be completely floodable. You clean up and you're you're good to go. Um, so both the Netherlands and New Orleans are really focusing on this this resilient design as well, even though they know levees and, and they use levees. Yeah, we have time for a few more. So I see some people over right here uh, in the line. Who are the gentlemen behind you? And then you can hand this to the gentleman in front of you. And I'll, I'll be quick. I'm next. Dave Hampton. Uh, I'm a practicing architect and I've gone back to school to do a Master of Design Studies in Risk and Resilience at Harvard GSD. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, well, the panel really, uh, reading Nancy's book, uh, what, what comes to mind is that for 350 years, water was not treated as a liability. It is now. To what extent does that drive development or redevelopment? Thank you. No. <laughs> it's about looking forward. I agree with Dave, but that's the past. Let's see what. Uh, so I'm going to answer this a bit obliquely. Um, so after 9 11, we remember that all our federal buildings were surrounded by Jersey barriers, and it felt like we were under siege, right? And so the goal was to protect these buildings, but it was really ugly. And if you look around our federal buildings today, they're still protected, but those barriers look like benches and planters and sculpture, right? And low walls. And so I think you're right that um, it's really easy to think about Hurricane Sandy or Katrina and think of the ocean as an enemy. I think a lot of what we're trying to do, and there is an extraordinary learning community, as you know, in Boston is to say, how can the inevitable be seen as an asset? You know, Boston must be different, but it doesn't have to be worse. It can be more beautiful if we're investing in new infrastructure, new housing, uh, new buildings. We can also solve other urban problems. You know, whether it's transportation system or energy efficiency or great open space. And I think we have to transform how we think about something as in inevitable as sea level rise into something that's an asset. We love living next to water as long as it's not in our basements and our, and our subway. So how can we stay a step ahead of where we expect that water to be and then have a backup in case it, it uh, still over jumps its bounds such that we can still be a really vibrant coastal city. So I think you're absolutely right that if we treat water as an enemy, we're going to suffer, right? Or if we, can ignore, if we ignore it, we're going to suffer. But we can really uh, work to adapt. I mean, ducks do it all the time, and you know, <laughs> ducks are good, salt marshes are good. Um, my name is Jack Joseph, I'm an architect, and I don't live in Boston, I live in Cambridge. 
<laughs> and I'm concerned about the fact that your focus is on Boston when it's a metropolitan area. And the issue, I think, in addressing it, at least at the bigger level, should be, needs to include all these. There's a whole Charles River Basin that will be impacted just as well, all the way to Harvard Square, I think. Yard. Yeah. The other, the other question is: Is the Army Corps of Engineers in any way interested or active in this? So the, <laughs> the good news is actually Cambridge is doing really well, and and Boston and Cambridge are are courting because we're the Boston Harbor Association. We don't uh, spend a lot of time uh, in Cambridge. We sort of end at the Charles River Dam. But um, in terms of Cambridge, you've got an extraordinary technocracy in Cambridge, or I do too, I actually live in Cambridge. And they read these reports, they saw Sandy, and uh, they are doing a gorgeous vulnerability assessment, adaptation plan. It will be a business school textbook case. You know, it's, they're, they're doing great work in Cambridge. Absolutely. I think if I can build on it, I didn't show the Cambridge examples, but as part of the ULI charrettes, we looked at the alewife area in Cambridge, and the, it was run by John Balduk from the city, and basically the question that he proposed was, if we were reading our zoning regulations with what we know now about sea level rise with the precipitation, how would we, how would we rebuild and reimagine Cambridge um, differently. And so that was the focus of the Cambridge charrette. And you can see kind of some of the examples within the report that we did. So I'm right over now, here. And now uh, might be a good time to give a shout out to the regional summit. Yeah. I would like to get a little <laughs> practical. Um, I love the idea of having a master plan. I love looking at some of the wonderful architecture that we can think about for the future. What are we going to do now, right now? And I think the first thing we need to do is stop the building of buildings that are going to not fit in with a future plan. Expect and have the regulations that they have to have some kind of sustainability, some kind of flood plan, instead of just allowing developers and, and developers may very well go along with this, but even if they don't, we have to have some plan. We don't allow the cycle farm companies to make a decision of what's toxic for our bodies. We try to have an FDA in there. We don't have the federal government. I'm really glad to hear about um, what the city is trying to do. We as citizens have to do more about that. Okay, good comment, thank you. And this gentleman over here. I'm Dennis Carlberg, the Sustainability Director at Boston University, architect and uh, co-author of Living with Water. Um, one question I'd love to hear the panel talk about is the fact that water knows no bounds. Our history has been developed with property boundaries, mm. with jurisdictional boundaries, and with this problem, that's going to change everything. And if we start putting up walls everywhere to protect our own individual properties, we're going to have a city nobody wants to live in. Right. So what do we do about that? Amy. <laughs> we need to start talking to each other. <laughs> um, I mean, it's going to take it's going to take changes in the political system in terms of how the different agencies are working together. How is MassDOT coordinating with the city, coordinating with Massport, coordinating with you know, other agencies? Um, and it's also, it gets back to the data. I mean, I think what surprised me the most is what we're using for the data and where our developments are going to flood is based on the Boston Harbor's, you know, great research about, you know, what floods at five feet, what floods at seven and a half feet, but we're designing our buildings to that. And we need to somehow come up with a mechanism that allows everybody to tap into um, kind of this broader regional data that is not just confined to their property boundaries, but allows them to evaluate the design that they're, they're proposing and its effects on you know, how much water it displaces, what the impacts are kind of to the neighboring regions and then to the neighborhoods that don't necessarily have the resources to, to protect themselves right now. So um, I think without intervention, we'll have the future you talked about, Dennis, um, in that there's, a, there's a, unfortunately, um, and that is actually the, the challenge, the public policy challenge is to work together. We have incredibly strong private property rights in this country, 
even though we're Massachusetts, we're really liberal libertarian, right? And um, you know, so we actually need to to turn that instinct that every person's castle is his or her or their home is their castle, right? You know that 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 builds a lot of moats and, and walls um, under that that mindset, and it is a big it's a big change for us to have very strong central planning, to have people move, to have people lose property rights. That's a, a major change. And um, I, I just had a chance to go to China. And you know, I'd rather live here than China. But boy, do they know central planning, right? You know, and, and, uh, you, know, and you, you go to the Netherlands, and they have a social contract that allows them to do that same kind of central planning. We don't have that kind of social contract at this moment in our history. And I, it does make it more difficult. And so, you know, talk about organizing. We need to have a, a common vision, but there will be winners and losers in common vision. You know, and, you, and most people bought their houses not knowing whether they were in the floodplain or not. So that's a tough one. Most of us do. <laughs> <Why not? laughs> um, we're, we're losing people. So I want Gretchen to be able to just come up here and give us a quick plug uh, of the competition, and, and then we're going to conclude. Absolutely. So to the question or the comment about this, is only, this doesn't end at Boston's municipal boundary, but rather you know, water, water has no mind for those political lines. Um, there, as Julie has already mentioned, there's very promising leadership in City Hall right now. And on October 29th, on the second anniversary of Sandy, Mayor Walsh announced that there will be a regional summit happening this spring. Um, the exact date has not yet been set, but it, they're looking at the end of April or beginning of May. So keep, look, keep your eyes out for that. And I think it's on all of us in this room and those of us in our circles to keep the pressure on to keep the conversation going about this because it absolutely is not a Boston problem just as it is not a Cambridge issue or a Lynn or Quincy or you know Duxbury or you know any one of these individual municipalities is something that we need to look at together. Well, those are excellent concluding words. The, the next uh, event here at BSA around the Olympics is going to be when? February 2nd. February 2nd so you can all come back here for another <laughs> robust conversation. Let's give it up for our panel. Also the name of my magazine, Improbable Research. It's all about things that, uh, as many of you know, uh, our, our mantra, our watchword, our watch phrase, whatever it is, things that make people laugh and then think. Much of this is science related, but much of it's not. It's pretty much anything that has that quality that it's funny when you first encounter it and then it sticks in your head and a week later Really, all you want to do is tell somebody about it, explain it, argue, whatever.